I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Kandro Kunzang. Kandro has been a devoted student of the Dharma for most of her life. She is a holder of the Kandro Toktik path of the Dujum Terser and the Rigzin Sugjob Yogic practices of the Northern Treasures lineage. Until the passing of Lama Dawa Rinpoche in 2017, she was his consort and companion and his main support for his teachings and activities in North America. Kanjo Kunzang now divides her time between teaching and traveling tours, serving as the executive director for Sari Swati Bawa, overseeing the translations and publications of practice texts on Sari Swati publications, heading the Purba Peace Mandala Project International, and offering teachings, guidance, and support to students worldwide. If you enjoy today's conversation, you can listen to our previous conversation that's linked in the episode notes. Well, thank you again so much, Kanjo Kunzong, for You're taking so the welcome. time. And I thought we could begin. There was um, a request from a listener who's also a Dharma friend about developing relative cities for healing power and magic. And she had gone to a talk. Uh, a mm-hmm. retreat with um, Emma Dorje Rinpoche, and he spoke about the significance of developing relative cities. And the reason I'm curious about asking you is that so often when we hear about relative cities, the notion is like, oh, it's a distraction. You should really be focusing on, you know, ultimate realization. And so what are your thoughts on on the cultivation of relative cities? Well, Well, I can certainly share my thoughts, but I'll also share my teacher's thoughts too. You know, because, of course, those are legitimate questions that we all have as Westerners, a little bit idealistic going into these practices. And, um, you know, Lama Dawa would also say the same thing again and again, that that he what he perceived to be a kind of ignoring the relative cities as being unimportant and poo-pooing it and no we don't want to waste our time with that we want ultimate cities but he would say you cannot get to ultimate cities without going through the relative cities that the relative cities are signs that you are on the way to ultimate cities you can't just jump over it like it's something we're just going to skip this and go right to the relative that that's a little bit nihilistic actually you know and so and it is part of the path when you are practicing a path in the tantras of any deity yoga there are these additional practices to develop these kinds of cities elaitsok they will usually call it the activity practices and the purpose is so that you can benefit beings in a relative level Right. So that's how you use the practice to benefit others. You you start to develop these abilities. And a really common one is divinations. Right. So Lama Dawa had the Siddhi of divinations. And I can't tell you how beneficial that was to so many people that they would come for consultations. And because he had the Siddhi of Sita, they call it, which means clear seeing, maybe you could say clairvoyance. Uh, so many people got benefit for their relative lives and also in their spiritual lives. So the cities are signposts on the way, and they will develop if you are if you are doing the practices according to the path and um, moving along and purifying your own obscurations. They are signs that will come up. And then how do you use that? And so there's extra little practices in there of how to develop and cultivate these abilities and you know so my teacher's attitude was that it's a natural part of the path you don't don't dismiss this because otherwise how are you really going to benefit others so i'm going to do my three-year retreat you know like lama dawa would meet many westerners who had done three-year retreats you know and their lamas and their teaching but they don't know anything about these activity practices And his view was it's your duty to benefit others using these methodologies that are associated with the practice that you did, that that's how you actually enact um, the active bodhicitta. We have wishing bodhicitta, right? And then we have this kind of actual bodhicitta. They say action bodhicitta, but doing 
So that's they're important. They are important. And Lama Dawa also felt like the reason why some teachers poo poo is because they don't have it. I mean, that, that was his view. That's not my opinion. I have no capacity to judge. But that's what they would say. Eh, they're just saying that because they don't have this ability. So, you know, they want to just kind of gloss over it. That that was their view. Mm. So, you know, maybe like that. And maybe there was this concern that um, you, if you don't have the meditative um, stabilization of holding an, an, an ultimate view, you can use these for mundane things and just get kind of like a low level, you know, I'm just doing this for me. But if you're properly on the Buddhist path, we're always um, putting others for, it's part of our training in our Bodhisattva path and our, we've trained to have this aspiration built in that my practices are for the benefit of all, including me. You know, and so it doesn't mean we deny that up for ourselves, but, um, you know, I think it goes without saying we all know that we're doing this for the greater good. You know, our practices are always for the greater good. And I think in Tibet, maybe there was this tendency for some practitioners to just do it for their own benefit. And also they needed to separate their tradition from a shamanic tradition which is all about magic and is all about, you know, doing these esoteric things for my own benefit. Right. But I, I don't, I never felt that in the West, we would have to worry about that. I think most practitioners that I know in the West, we, we know that we're doing this for the greater good. So it's holding that view is not a problem, but um, yeah. So I think maybe they're trying to avoid maybe that as a downfall, people get too caught up with, you know, doing something for their own benefit, but I don't personally think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And and then there's the other thing that being trained in it. There's you know, you have to learn how to do these methods. And sometimes, um, you know, there's difficult things we have to get. There's you know, it's all part of training and taking the time to learn it. My teachers had that view, and I kind of share that view as well um, because I've seen the benefits. You know, I have totally seen the benefits. And so, so I advocate for, for these kinds of activities as and part of our path. And will you talk about that? Some of the trainings to cultivate cities and where that fits into the tantric path. These activities always fall under the, there's four different categories of activities, right? We would say pacification, enriching, empowering, and um, wrathful subjugation. So all activities fall under one of those four categories, you know, and we always pray to be able to enact the four activities, you know, it's part of our aspirations. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by doing such practices that um, develop those qualities. And so there are different practices from the different tantric cycles in the Yeshe Sogyal, for example, there's the late sok, which is a collection of different uh, visualization and mantra recitations you would do or using different substances. But of course, they will be done after you have completed the generation stage of that deity, right? So they're not something you just jump into. They're part of the, you could say that, or after the Zogrim, right? Then you can do these activities to develop and work on these cities like divin being able to do divinations and things like this. So it's a little practice you do that's you know, visualization, mantra recitation, and then there are signs, right? There's always signs actually in all tantric practice and there's all tests to test that you have those abilities. Like for example, when I was learning how to do divination with a dice, there's a dice divination in the, in the Dujum lineage, I was tested, you know, Lama Dawa would sometimes, people would write to request to do divinations and he would have me do it. And then he would look in the mirror and check to see my accuracy, you know, like this. So you get tested. There are ways that you get tested. It's part of the training. And some of these are have to do with Dharma protectors. You know, there are some activities that are related to, so you would do a separate practice for a Dharma protector. Like in the trauma, we have this Rahula practice that's done as a separate practice. And there's many, many activities related to Rahula. 
-hmm. So it's oftentimes it's the Dharma protectors that are out doing these activities. We're sending them off to do these different activities, right? So then you have to have special empowerments, the sulk tick for the Dharma protector, and then you do a course of um, practice to develop this. And then your Dharma protectors are your retinues enacting these four activities, right? So there's different ways. And then there are just simply um, additional practice. I don't call them practices. I call them activities. I separate practice from activities, right? So practice is our nundro and our generation of a deity, the kerim and the zogrim into the yogas and the tumo and the tsalung and in, then into the trek toga like this. This is a path of practice that we are doing to cultivate our, to develop ourselves spiritually, our spiritual progress and our evolution and going through the stages in the path. We have our practice. And then besides that, there are many, many other things that we can do to benefit others, which are activities. And those are the kinds of things I've been teaching, like the song and the sur and the tashi yanguk. I call these activities. I don't call these practices, right? So they're in addition to our personal practice that we do for our, our own cultivation. Mm -hmm. Then we can do activities, and then that's for the purpose of benefiting others or benefiting a situation or a place or whatever. There's different benefits benefits according to the four categories, pacification, enriching, um, empowering, and subjugating. And besides that, there are more specialized activities. The ones that I'm teaching are sort of general layperson's practices, but there are some very specialized ones. For example, in the, let's say in the Kondratutik cycle, Dujum lineage, many people are familiar with that. The Dakini practice, that whole body of work, right, that text or that volume you have in, within the, the whole Dujum Sungbum, all the texts of the, of the Dujum, you have one text, volume Ma, <laughs> or the 16th text called, that's all, the whole thing is the Khandra Tuktik, and there's like almost 700 pages in there, and half of that will be the things we do for our personal practice, the Nundros and the the Leijong activities, and then the Salung and the Tumo, and then all the commentaries, how to do your retreat, many, many, about half of that. And the other half are all these different things. Once you've done those practices, there's how to make treasure vases, how to make mindrup, how to do reversing ransom offerings to dispel negativity, how to increase somebody's longevity, you know, so all kinds of things that fall under those four pacification, enriching, empowering, and subjugating. There's many different things. Even there's one for agriculture that I just love, the low pen of how to grow your crops and how to, you know, manage insect problems and how to make fertilizer. There's amazing things in there that are all parts of that cycle, that tantric cycle related to Yeshi Soyel. And all deities have this. Every deity in any tradition, that volume of that deity will be a big portion of that are all these different activities. And of course, those are for the people who have practiced. For, so you practice, then through your practice, you develop the ability to then do these activities. And that's how you're benefiting others. Otherwise, how are you benefiting others, right? You're sitting there doing your Tara practice and medicine, but whatever for, for your own practice. And, you know, is it benefiting me? You could say it is, you know, theoretically, we aspire that it is, but is it actually benefiting me? You know, like there's different levels. And so because we pray to benefit others, how are we going to do that? Well, when we have finished, the cycle of the deity, here's all these ways that you can benefit others. And one of the observations that Lama Dawa made when he was coming to the West, and I've heard Lama Pema Dorje say this too, that 
there's a lot of people who have done three year retreats and they don't know anything about these activities and they're not really doing them. And that, that he was always puzzled by that. And it seems to be in the West, we think the way that we're going to benefit others is to be a teacher. I'm going to be a Lama and I'm going to teach. That's how I'm benefiting. But in their culture, you don't necessarily become a teacher. There's a lot of incredible practitioners. They don't really have students and they're doing these activities to benefit others. Right, so their idea of how you're going to benefit others, now you've done this, why did you do this practice in the first place? Now you're going to benefit others by doing all these different activities that work with the elements that work on these four levels, you know, that address most of our problems, you could say, you know. So that's the importance of developing what you could say the city or developing the capacity to do all these kinds of activities whether they're related to dharma protectors or whether they're just parts of a cycle of a particular deity practice right so it's like our duty lama dawa would say like when a student finishes their course of you know khandra tuktik or whatever he's like your duty now and he would teach us these it, he made it a point to teach us these things and felt like you have to do this, you know, and, and still there's a little bit of this idea that, well, that's what those they do over there in Nepal and the Asian lamas do this, you know, um, but his idea was, no, no, you have to do this. You have to learn how to do these activities. The fire pujas are one common one a lot of people know about, Jinsek. That's a very profound activity and, and a lot of Westerners do know how to do this. But there's a lot of other very specialized things, like the re a lot of the reversal activities, the ransom offerings, the de or the lu or the guks to hook, la, the la guks or these kinds of increasing activities. <laughs> the wrathful activities tend to be a little more uh, difficult and uh, more closely held because you have to have really good confidence in yourself as the yidam you have to like tibetans are very reticent to do wrathful activities unless you're very confident in your yidam because they say it can bounce back on you right if you're not really holding the view so they're not usually just the nakbas are doing <laughs> these wrathful activities what do you feel like are some really important activities that we could do right now that would be that anything, means you're not seeing that it are happening, you know? Yeah, anything that has to do with pacification. You know, it's the first activity, and it's maybe the, it doesn't sound like a powerful thing, but it really is. You know, pacification undercuts aggression, right? Now we're living in very aggressive times, very hostile times, very contentious with lots of conflict, lots of anger, and lots of fear. The best antidote to that is pacifying all of this. And there's different ways to pacify. You know, I sometimes like to tell this story. When um, one time I was with His Eminence Garchin Rinpoche, he was teaching in Canada and I was accompanying him. At that time I was a nun in the Drikung tradition and we were staying with um, a Tibetan family that was hosting him and we're driving on our way to where the teachings were gonna be in Toronto. And Rinpoche is sitting in the passenger side and Tashi, who is driving, and I'm sitting in the back seat with another American monk. And, and we're driving in the city of Toronto to go to this place and we pull up at a stop light, a big intersection, very crowded. We pull up and right next to us pulls up a pickup truck. It's summertime, you know, and their windows are down. And, you know, Gartram Boucher is sitting there with his prayer wheel. And he's always sitting there with his prayer wheel, spinning, spinning, spinning. And this pickup truck pulls up, the windows are down. And these guys, they look like some, you know, worker construction guys, looks down and sees Rinpoche and us, all monks. And, and they say, ah, look at, yeah, get a job. You know, like the kind of negative, um, you know, insulting comments made at Rinpoche. And Rinpoche doesn't understand what they're saying, but you could certainly tell by the tone of their voice, you know, and he's, and he just turns his head and he looks at them and he gives them this huge smile. 
this, you know, how he does this beaming smile and they suddenly were like frozen in place. Like this is pacification activity in action. Whatever he was beaming his beautiful white Tara energy at these guys who were being hostile and insulting. And I was starting to feel like, uh oh, please light turn, 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 you know, like, I don't want to have a, an altercation with these people. They were very aggressive. And he just like completely pacified with a big smile. And the light turned green and we take off and there they were still sitting there like frozen. Like they were completely immobilized, whatever he did. <laughs> you know, so that's like pacification activity in action can just cut um, aggression like this. So I would say, you know, at this time, pacification activity is really important. And practices like song that purify, practices that purify, practices that are offering related, that we're making offerings, 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 making offerings to the Nagas like this, to make them satisfied, making offerings to hungry ghosts, to satisfy, 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 because that means that's how you pacify. You pacify by satisfying, right? That's the, that's the key. When a being or a person wants to be aggressive, it's because something inside them is not satisfied right? Then they want to lash out or they want to attack or whatever. It's dissatisfaction that is at the root of so much of this behavior. So pacification is the way to bring this feeling of satisfying. And then you have no, like these guys in the pickup truck, like completely cut whatever that the speech and the mind with the thinking that they were having in this stopped, stopped in their tracks. So, you know, I think pacification activity is very, very, and it's, and it is the most common activity. The other ones are a little more specialized, enriching, empowering, and um, wrathful subjugation is, is only in, in dire situations used, you know, when you need some kind of strong intervention. Um, but the pacification is something that everybody can practice. It's safe, you know, that way and has a, a, a wonderful effects. Thank you. And, yeah. and in terms of, I mean, I guess going a little further into the current circumstance, I, I don't know when this podcast will necessarily get released, but there's always wars happening. I mean, there's some countries that have been in the midst of war for full lifetimes, uh, currently. And, and obviously right now we have the situation happening in Ukraine. And I think sometimes we can feel like offerings aren't enough. Like we're not, it's not going to actually pacify. And I'm curious just because you've been in this world for so long and you've heard so many stories and witnessed so much, especially in the realm of relative cities, have you witnessed any kind of experience of firsthand, like you're sharing the experience of the smile and wondering if there's been other moments of really focusing on worldly affairs or larger groups of people where you've really seen the impact of, of practice or in activities in, in particular. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, there's situations like mm, I've witnessed going to very derelict towns, you know, a place where there's a lot of homelessness and drug use and just, you, you know, you can feel that energy in a town like we had an experience once we were invited to actually two places one was in new mexico one was in california a person invited lama dao to give teachings in their home and that's how lama dao liked to teach he liked to teach in people's living rooms you know and there was a couple places we went to where there were it's like wow this is a really uh what you would call like a negative energy space and lama dao also kind of could sense there was a lot of spirits and things there and we would do practices there you know he he would have this inspiration or his dharma protector or a dream like we should do this practice you know we should do this song or we should do this and you know just let's do it together as a sangha and then we would leave go on our merry way and a few months later we would get like a message from the the person saying oh you'll never believe this but you know, like the whole town started to change and a, a shift in that energy 
started to happen and, and like new thing, new things started flourishing and there it was a total shift of the atmosphere and after a year it was like a come but we and then we would go back to that town a year later and it was like this is a very different place you know so i've seen that where just and and of course when we're doing the practice we're always doing it for the benefit of all beings including the beings in this particular area like this and not having an agenda there wasn't like an agenda, like we're going to do this practice and it's going to produce this result. No, you just do it. You just offer and you do without an expectation or, or a target or an aim. If you have a specific, like this practice is going to produce this result, you've narrowed the field and you don't want to do this. You, that's why we, it's for all sentient beings. Sometimes I think it's just for the highest good, whatever that is, and I can't even conceive of what that might even be. That's kind of limiting for me to think that I would know what is the best in this situation. I don't have that kind of enlightened mind that I can see every dynamic about that place to know what's best. But that's what we pray. We, we dedicate and we pray. That's why our dedications are like that for all sentient beings. Or, you know, it's just a vast um on different you know on particular you know and and then m uh, more things can happen because however that energy is used is truly <laughs> used i believe for whatever is the highest good for that situation it may not be what you expect mm -hmm. right so that's how i've seen practices that we might do and like fire pujas ginsecs have increment tremendous beneficial effects for a place or an area you know and we're not doing it to say i'm gonna make this particular thing happen but lo and behold you will observe you can observe that um, the area experiences you know far less problems and more positive things come and people are more happy and there's less crime like this kind of thing, less of this, these signs of um, difficulties, you know, so that's, those are some examples where I've seen that. And I've also heard this, um, that back during the Cold War, between this very intense tension between the U.S. and Russia, you know, decades ago, that Dujar Rinpoche very specifically told a few of his practitioners to go into do a 10-year retreat on Vajrakalaya and they were in retreat for 10 years and when they came out of retreat it was when the Berlin Wall fell you know so that's kind of a legendary story and I don't know particularly who they were but this is what I I believe is some of the benefits of these more profound practitioners who are in retreat doing these kinds of things it's just it was an interesting timing and i like to think because vajra kalaya cuts the energy of warfare it's very specific about um cutting the that negative energy of hatred and anger which leads to warfare and here were these practitioners doing a retreat and they came out of retreat and bam the berlin wall fell russia the whole thing just kind of fizzed. i think that was in the late 80s you know, and so like this, I, I believe that these practices, when they're done, especially by people who have gone through the path and they're, it's a matter of faith, <laughs> you know, having the faith. I have faith because I've seen it. And, um, but it's not a tangible thing, right? It's not tangible, like, like serving people in a soup kitchen. Like that's very tangible, right? or you know donating money well now everybody wants to donate money to ukraine this is a, something tangible we feel i'm doing something but these spiritual practices are intangible and so in our materialistic world it's hard for us to believe that there's benefit and that just shows how material we've become <laughs> really you know so it's an intangible method that brings in the beginning, it's intangible, but you can, you will see there'll be these kinds of improvements or just kind of a tense situation just kind of settles out for some unexplainable reason, you know. You, you will see this for sure. I mean, there's been interesting research 
about the power of med groups of people meditating. There's a famous study that was done, I think, by the Maharishi people in Washington, D.C., where they calculated with a population a certain size, how many people do you need to be meditating to have an effect on this population? And they did this research where groups of people were doing the TN meditation that they learn, and all the crime went down. The crime rates went down in Washington, D.C. You know, so there's some interesting research that that shows the power of, and that's meditating, that's not doing rituals, but spiritual practice mm -hmm. can have these effects. And so it's, yeah, it's a matter of believing it. <laughs> yeah. And I like that you say that, like it's the paying attention to it over time, because sometimes it's hard when something doesn't happen right away, but the more that's often right. kind of can pay attention. Then that's because we have expectations that this has to happen as a result instead of being open to, well, maybe something else is going to happen that's even better, you know, and also as far as the timing goes, it just means it needs to be done more. You need to repeat whatever you're doing more. Mm -hmm. Like I, this is what I would see in mirror divinations. People would have things done according to the divinations and well, and then they have to, was there much effect? Okay, let's do it again. Was there much effect? Oh, now let's do it again. Well, you just have to repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> And about prosperity and wealth rituals, I know you also, this is one of the activities you share is supporting people enriching their lives in this way and, and their communities. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there's this disconnect between wealth and prosperity and spiritual life. What is their relationship? How does that relate to um, Dharma? These are enriching activities. Wealth practices fall under the category of enriching activities. And when you're... Um, when you're connecting with a source of wealth, which is the five elements, right? They're all about increasing the power and potency of the five elements. Mm -hmm. And that brings vast benefit to the, to the landscape, to the weather, to the crops, to, you know, everybody's prosperity is enriched, right? And so some of it has just has to do with what do you think wealth is? Do you think it's fiat currency? like how many dollars I have in my bank account. You know, we had to have this kind of bigger view about wealth and prosperity and this sense of enrichment. And my teachers would say it's because, you know, if you're homeless and starving, it's going to be hard to do practice, you know, as practitioners. Like, you know, there's the famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, if you're in survival mode, you're not going to have the bandwidth to think about philosophical and spiritual practices, you're just going to be totally caught up in survival mode, right? And so as practitioners, we want to have the support so that we can do our practices without ob obstacles, right? So that's a, that's a personal reason why we might want to do wealth deity practices so that we have the opportunities and the, um, the necessary supports that we need to do whatever practices we're doing, whether it's we need to take the time off from work or we've got to go travel someplace or, you know, these all, you know, we have to have some kind of material support for that, or we need special ingredients or things we have to magnetize to us like this. So for our personal practice, we want to have the conducive circumstances to do our practice. Of course, it's for the ben ultimately for the benefit of others. But all of these practices have to do with the elements and enriching the elements. And so there is always this greater benefit and it falls under the category of enriching activity. So it's among the enlightened activities of the Buddhas. And these four activities are considered the enlightened activities of the Buddhas. If you're doing it from this kind of grasping fear, you know, then it's difficult. Maybe you'll get some results, but, um, you know, then that's not the right view, right? So you're doing this practice because you feel the need. There's a need there, but it's not for you. It's for, you know, you and your sphere and your mandala, <laughs> your, you know, your retinues like this. You've got to have the bigger uh, mind motivation. Yeah. I wanted to actually just turn our mind towards landscape the ways that landscape can support realization. And, you know, there are definitely particular landscapes that have been likened to deities and that offer reflections for understanding reality. And I guess I was curious, 
if there are certain elemental formations, like such as kinds of moving water and the ways land arises, like mountains and valleys that can help turn one's mind towards uh, recognition. Yeah, there are things in texts that will say, like again, with these four activities, like there are, there are said that to do a wrathful activity, you should find certain kind of landscapes where the, the skyline is like a triangle, you know, sharp angles like this. And pacification activities are done with this a kind of vast open view. There definitely are um, land formations that are mentioned in texts that will help facilitate certain meditative experiences because of the shape of the, the horizon line you know, and, um, and also water. Like in general, the idea is you don't want to do much practice in front of rushing water because it carries all your cities away, you know, and you want to be in a high place, not in a low valley place, you know. So there's some general ideas about how different landscapes can affect the energies that you're trying to cultivate, for sure. You know, and, and those are, you know, sort of in the maha, yoga and also in the anu yoga of course you want to be cold it has to be cold you know open sky <laughs> like this and the ati yoga there's no then you you know because the landscape is in your being you know then all that gets internalized as you're moving into the anu yoga the landscapes are internalized the the pilgrimage places are in your own body right and so you're not so dependent on the external to cultivate those experiences Right, so that at some point in, it becomes internalized. Right, so, but yeah, there are things, there are certain kinds of landscapes that are conducive to certain kinds of practices and forest versus being next to water or, you know, mountain, snow mountains versus being in the fertile plain like this. You know, I mean, in general, we should be able to practice anywhere, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's the thing. We, we tend to think I need a quiet place. There's some practices, like for example, the Ruchen practice, you know, the classically you've got to find an isolated place where no one's going to observe you because you're going to be acting out certain things. You know, so you want privacy, you know, so you can make loud sounds and the police won't come. You know? <laughs> so there are sometimes guidelines, you know, and in Salong it has to be completely private. No, not even the animals can see you like this and very cold winter time. Should practice, you're on the charnel grounds, right? You're on the places that are kind of revolting and ooh, I don't want to go there or some place that engenders kind of fear. And, you know, I think in the modern world of what I think of the most scariest place would be like in the subway tunnels of New York City, you know? I would be terrified to go there, you know? So like, what's the scariest place? Like these, you know, are according to the practices that you're doing, you know, but in general, um, you know, if, if, if you're not doing a practice that's stating a particular place, then it's something that you feel comfortable, you know, something you feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, my first retreat in Nepal with, with the Yeshe Sogyal practice, we were building our house in, in Boda. If the house was still under construction and I'm getting locked away on the top floor for six months and oh my gosh, it was so noisy, you know, like we were putting in these marble floors and stairways and they were jackhammering the marble and, and it was, I was like, <sighs> and I was so mad at Lama Dao. I'm like, why are you making me do a retreat here? I want to go to Parping where it's queer, you know, and <laughs> But he was like, you know, if you can do retreat here, you can do it anywhere. And after about, you know, a couple of weeks of this, I kind of settled down and it just became kind of incorporated into my practice. And I came away from that feeling like, oh, I could, I can do retreat anywhere. You know, it was noisy and, you know, disruptive. And then my, then my next retreat was in Iowa and we had this like remote cabin out in nowhere. And I thought, this is a perfect place to do a retreat. It's quiet, it's remote, no one's going to bother me. And as soon as I put the boundaries up for the retreat, a rat moved in to my cabin 
and I had to listen to this rat scratching in the walls all day above my head, sleeping, scratch, 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 scratch. It drove me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I just had to laugh at the irony of it all, you know, here I was in this beautiful remote place and this rat moved it. It was in the fall and then all mice and mice move in to buildings in the fall. And it wasn't a mouse. It was a rat. It was making so much noise and chewing up stuff and keeping me up at night. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything about it because I'm locked into this little little house. But even the most beautiful circumstances you know, you'll have something that bothers you, <laughs> you know, so that's the real point of doing a retreat is you're not dependent on outside circumstances to make the perfect place for you. You know, that's ultimately where we go. But there are certain practices that you're doing that the outer environment and the kind the lay of the land and the maybe you could say the feng shui of the land can really help engender those energies. Mm -hmm. Well, you've shared about two yogis who in recent years entered Tukdam. Uh, one was a trauma practitioner, mm -hmm. Shiva Lodra Rinpoche, who passed away in the Himalayas at age 49. And then you also talk about the Dakini Sangyum Riksin Wanglo, mm -hmm. who passed away in New York City at age 89. And I just wanted to mention the locations, which you mentioned as well, which I find just good for the listener, right? So we don't think everybody enters Tukdam in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can can you speak about the phenomena of Tukdam? I mean, it's really a sign of a person's meditative absorption during the disillusion process, right? So there are practices that you learn in the yoga practices of dissolving the elements, because that's what happens when we die. We have this successive dissolution of the earth and the water and the fire, air, and finally into space. And then our subtle body system is disintegrating at the same time and is giving rise to experiences that happens to everybody. And in a practitioner who has perfected these practices, they are kind of controlling the process and um, not being swept in it, you know, just helplessly, but they are intentionally dissolving. And then you get to the most subtle when, when finally everything is kind of in the heart chakra, the final dissolution. And by that time they're dead like they're not breathing and their heart's not beating, they're clinically dead, but they're in this suspended state of, of a meditative absorption. So they're seen to be meditating. That's what they will say, they're in deep meditation. Like Lama Dawa was in Tukdam when he passed away. And, um, and he told us, don't let me sit longer than three days. And so he had to be taken out of Tukdam there's a special ritual that they did to call him out of Tukdam because we're going to burn your body now. And you, you know, you're not allowed to burn their body while they're sitting in Tukdam. Like the Dujum Yangzi, I believe is still in Tukdam. I haven't heard that they've cremated him. Mm -hmm. So you have to wait until they come out of this meditation before you burn them. Cause they're you know, the, so the subtle, subtle, subtle mind is still there and it's completing these subtle disillusion processes. And why did Lama Dawa want to be taken out after three days? Well, he just said, don't let me sit longer than three days. I don't know. It was his, his, his wish, you know? So, and then the Lamas who were in charge of, of his process looked at the astrology and we picked the day to uh, do the cremation, which happened to fall on Guru Rinpoche day. You know, so and then he had to be taken because he was still in Tukdam, right? So he had to be taken out of Tukdam before we before we cremated his body. Otherwise, I mean, the lamas there that was Sang Sangay Rinpoche and Dondu Rinpoche from the um, Namka Kyungzong. They they thought, oh, he would he would have been in Tukdam for a long time, and then the body will shrink. You know, the when they're in Tukdam for a long time, the dissolution, the, so the elements are being transmuted into their their subtle properties, which is light. And that's why phenomena of rainbows and lights appear because it's the elements have their subtle counterparts, which are the quality of light. And that's their physicality of the physical body and the elemental is being transmuted into light. And so the bodies can actually shrink. And then there's rainbow phenomena and other light phenomena but they have to be sitting for a long time for that. 
you know, so, you know, they were of the opinion that he would probably have done that, but he told us not to let him sit longer than, than three, three days. So that's what we did. Whereas others like Shembendawa Rinpoche, when he also passed in May and I was at their, that funeral, he was in Tukdam for quite some time. So they, they kind of let it. Then there's the sign when that now that consciousness has left the body and then, then the body kind of slumps and acts like a corpse. <laughs> but while they're in Tukdam, they're, they don't look like they're dead. You know, you don't have the, the, the nose shrinking and the eye, you know, the, you don't have this. They're supple and they're often sitting, you know, like there's tone and suppleness and there's often warmth here in the torso because all the energies have been drawn in and, um, and they're flexible. They don't get rigor mortis, right? They're very flexible, right? So, was, so that's a very interesting phenomena even though they're clinically dead. So, but that's what's going on is a, a very, they're doing the subtle disillusions of those practices and, and how long they abide in that state is we don't know. And for them, I don't think, you know, they're not having an experience of relative time like we are. They're just in this meditative state. And it's also when a being is in this Tukdam state to be near some, like their, you could really feel the quality. You know, I had the opportunity to experience this with Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche because I was there after he passed and they had his body in, in a box and salt before they, and then they were waiting to, for the time to do the cremation. But to be in the presence of somebody who's in Tukdam is, is an atmosphere is full of, you can feel it. It's a tangible what what could you call it a blessing you know is there something is radiating so their their mind has been freed of the elementality of the physicality and it's now radi it's free to radiate you know and Lama Dawa used to tell people, you know, because people when he was dying they would be oh Lama Dawa, you're going and he's like I'm not going I'm coming wow so he more available, more present, more, and you can really feel that it's a very great blessing. So even now, you know, Dujum practitioners, because the Dujum Yangzi's in Tibet, I, you know, but he's in Tukdam. So it means that that and that enlightened mind is now free and avail more freely available, and we can tap into it if we have devotion. It's a great opportunity. Because they're still kind of in this dimension. There's there's still this thread and attached to the physical body it hasn't hasn't left. Then when they come out of Tuktam and then the body will then decompose and do all, you know, then they cremate the bodies and try, you know, relics will often. That's the other sign is when there's relics. So then they'll cremate the body and then uh, oftentimes they cremate the body in a special bumba and then they seal that up for a certain amount of time, maybe a week, and all the pujas are being done. Then they'll open that and go see the ashes and look for special relics and special signs. And in the case of Lama Dawa, he didn't want that. He, you know, he, he said, no, just burn me at Ramadol Charnel Ground where everybody else could. He didn't want any of this kind of special treatment. And so the next day, Dondro Prabhupada, Kelsang and I, we went to collect the ashes and there was full of relics everywhere. He was shocked because usually you don't have relics when you have an open cremation like this. You know, they, they, they put the, them in bumpas to control the temperature because if it's too hot, you won't get the relics. But in Lama Dao's case, he says, nope, you just burn me on this open cremation place in Ramadolo, or this place in Nepal, next to the river. And yet, in the next morning, it was full of relics. It was so unusual to see that. And, but the relics are then the sign of this purified, the elements had become purified like this, and then they produce these relics, which then multiply, you know? I mean, I have some of those relics, and they, there's more. <laughs> there's more than there was before. They, they, it's like a, some, they're kind of life force in there, some living thing. 
and they they multiply like cell mitosis you know they grow they look like little cells and they grow a little one and then they separate like cell mitosis is really interesting these relics phenomena and it's some some living intangible force there that can't be explained by science and things like that but that's often a person who's been and took them when they're cremated then the relics show the consciousness is not a thing you know we're not talking about some particular thing that's going to go somewhere right it's that's not the buddhist view the buddhist view is we don't have a a, a soul atma thing that goes from here to there i mean in unenlightened sentient beings it's a con it's a coalescence of many many karmic propensities all glommed together and that transmigrates but it's not a particular thing and in a being who has purified this they they actualize the kayas right so it's not like their consciousness goes somewhere right it's it's dissolved into the dharmakaya it becomes pervasive with all of space it's not a particular thing in a particular location, <laughs> right? So they're dissolved and they've actualized the Dharmakaya. And by and then from the Dharmakaya can arise the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya to benefit others if they so choose, right? That would be like a tulku kind of thing, right? So they've actualized the Dharmakaya. They're pervasive in the Buddha nature, which is all pervasive. Mm -hmm yeah so they it can become anything actually mm -hmm. i feel like actually this would, would be a good place to talk about just some fundamental language especially in tantra i mean i know this is also in mahayana and sutriana but the the terms of union the, the union of wisdom and method i would love to hear the significance and meaning of these individually and and then also when they're brought together top share right method and um wisdom wisdom is the feminine factor top or you could say compassion there's all these names that are talking about the two two sides of the same coin they really are and so you know my teachers would always always say they're like two wings of the bird mm -hmm. right you need both you cannot just have one or just the other right because then you could fall into the two extremes of nihilism eternalism like there's another way of of looking at this we need both wisdom and we need both method compassion right and so the practices that we do have to have both of those so practices should like like for example we were talking about like activities right to benefit others that's method but they have to be conjoined with the wisdom of our samadhi, right? So we bring in the wisdom aspect by how well we can maintain a meditative state while we are doing these activities. So that's the union of method and wisdom. Otherwise, it's just method, and then it becomes like shamanism, right? Or wisdom only, meditating, 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 is not really benefiting really right because the the activity the compassion that's the method side i you know i often think of the yin and yang symbol i think that's a great symbol because they have they are together whole they're a wholeness and then that wholeness gets this first kind of division of duality like this right and so that's how we we talk about it to to kind of understand this side and this side the yin side the yang side and our practices need to have a balance of both. And so the union of that is bringing them both together, making sure that they're all, that they're both present. So all of the activities that we do, the wisdom, we are cultivating the wisdom side by doing these generation stage practices. And that's to give, to give rise to our wisdom awareness, to develop that wisdom awareness. Maybe that's where we're the weakest right? Because we live so much in the relative world of doing, doing, doing this, doing that. And so we're trying to develop this wisdom awareness 
And then from that wisdom awareness place, we have all these activities that we can do, right? And so that's the union of, of that in a general way. And then when you get to the yoga practices, they get very specific about masculine, feminine sides. Prajna Paramita, which is always personified as a woman, right? The, the iconography, because it's the source, right? Like the spacious sky gives birth to all things, right? Mm -hmm. So the wisdom is, is sometimes considered like the absolute nature. If we want to talk about relative and absolute, that's another way of talking about it. So the wisdom side is the absolute nature and it's given a feminine, it's feminized because it's what gives birth, right, to the activity, right? And it's also the Dharmakaya, right? So the Dharmakaya is that absolute Dharmakaya, wisdom, emptiness that talk about that one side and it gets personified as a feminine type of energy that the because because women are are the birth givers right and you know, and, and there's also a lot of statements in there that that gender women <laughs> you know human women have an easier time cultivating wisdom awareness practices because that energetic is what is being expressed in us in this current embodiment if we have a female form that's what's being expressed and then the the compassion side is the act active side the method the skillful way that you're going to benefit others from that absolute space and then we have the sambhogakaya nirmanakaya right and this is the um the forms and um Maybe you could even say the vibrational nature of things. You know, like you have space, emptiness, and then you have the vibrational nature of things, which is the movement of this and that and do, the doing part as opposed to being. And that's given a masculine, that's um, considered to be a masculine energy of doing. You know, and it's kind of interesting because I've, I've seen um, child psychology, you know, talking about these kind of differences of, little boys and little girls, and they will say, you know, little girls on their own, they make, they make pots, they make little things that are like vessels that hold things where little boys make projectile things. It's just kind of like there's something very innate in that that the boys kind of do and project out, you know, and girls contain and, and nur the nurturing, you know, it's kind of, you can see it, you know, if you want to make these kind of generalizations. You know, but um, that's the idea. That's how it gets expressed in this physical world. But there, the spiritual principles are like are like that. You know, so it's our aim to actualize our absolute nature of the wisdom. And then, because then then the activities that we do are imbued with the wisdom, then we're not doing activities from a an ego, you know, or a you know from desire, ignorance, anger, we're doing them from an enlightened perspective, and then our activities can truly benefit. So last time you shared stories about Dorje Kunzung Rinpoche and his intensity. I'm curious if there have any stories from him where maybe a teaching didn't seem like it was a teaching, but later on it appeared to be one. Um, Everything was a teaching with him and yeah. a challenge, you know, because he challenged he challenged me and his students, you know, like testing, you know, like in the very, when I first met Rinpoche, I was a nun, right? I had come to Nepal in 1999. This was after, you know, I met Lama Dawa in 1998. And then he came in the U.S. and I accompanied him on his tour in 1999. Cause, and the whole thing was, you know, I'm going to go to Nepal and meet Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche, right? And so, and I didn't know who he was, but I just felt the kind of, I don't know, propheticness of it. And, um, and so then there, so I met him and I shared a little bit about that first meeting, but I was then wanting to make a request to accept uh, me as his student, you know? And so he kind of put me through a series of challenges, like, oh, you want to be my student? Okay, you're a nun and I'm a nakba, you know? And so he would do things like, okay, go and get me some whiskey, go buy some whiskey for me in the store, you know, and it's like, as a nun, we're not allowed to drink alcohol, you know, we have very strict vows about that, 
And now I'm going to go into the shop and buy a big bottle of whiskey. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, and so and he did that to see how I would react. Am I going to hesitate? Am I going to just do? And I, and I knew what he was doing. I knew he's testing me. And so without hesitation, I went up and bought whiskey and brought it back to him. And then he pours it in a glass and he hands it to me. He says, here, now drink this. And, and so in that moment, you know, I've got like, okay, I know what he's doing. What am I going to do? Am I going to stay with my, the precepts that I took as a nun, which came from Shakyamuni Buddha, right? This is from a Buddha from long ago, this lineage, long, long lineage, and came to, from my Kempo to me, or am I going to see him as Guru Rinpoche giving me precepts in this particular moment in time? What's my choice? It was my choice. I could have said no. I could have said, oh, I can't do that. I knew what he was doing. And because I did see him as Guru Rinpoche, it's, it's you know, I, I saw, to me, this was Guru Rinpoche. And I thought, he, this is his precept to me. He's giving me a precept mm. in living time. These are the words of a living Buddha giving me a precept in this moment in time. Just like Shakyamuni did, you know, when Shakyamuni developed all these Vinaya vows, they, he didn't just come up with it in one day. It was evolved over a time when, when the monks were kind of naughty. They did something naughty. And then he says, okay, now we're going to make a vow. From now on, you can't do this. Right? So during the time of Shakyamuni, if you were his student, you would have, you know, one day there was a new vow you had to follow, right? And then that became the collection of Vinaya vows. Well, here he was telling me, here, you do this. I knew what he was doing. I just, okay, bottoms up. <laughs> and, and so like this, it was a test to see what my view was, how much faith I had in him. And like this, he put me through these different tests. <laughs> and then the ultimate test was, you know, to say, okay, really, you want to be my student, you have to marry Lama Dawa. So like these, you know, they, they will push you to see where you stop, where is your limitation, where, where is your view? And where's your doubt, the doubts and the fears that come up in, in your mind? Because ultimately, when you're going to be going deeply in the practices, you cannot have any doubt about your teacher. You have to have absolute trust in the teacher because the purpose of these many of these practices is to push you beyond your comfort zone. And you have to really believe that this teacher is going to guide you in the right way and is not going to mislead you, right? That's a, a little bit of a problem nowadays. You know, sometimes um, we don't choose correctly or we don't recognize the, you know, what's an authentic teacher, as, as we say. Um, and the teacher isn't out for our best interest, right? So you had to have something in you. And I think it's because I had this past life connection with Rinpoche, which I explained a little bit in my last um, interview that just, it, I can't explain why I felt this trust in him. I can't explain that. There wasn't a rational reason, and I hardly knew him. Clearly, it was a karmic thing. But here I showed up as this American lady, you know, and so he's got to see, where is this, you know, yes, he remembered me from my past life, but I'm an American, I'm an American adult now. Let's see if her mind is ready for this, you know, and, and they were very, powerful experiences of also my own mind, you know, entering into different, being able to enter into different states and be being more ripened, <laughs> as they would say. Mama Dawa did the same thing, you know, would say something to a student and look at their reaction. How do they react? If there was hesitation or doubt or then he would just know, okay, well, I'm not going to go there. And I'm sure that if I, if I hesitated and said, no, Rinpoche wouldn't, he would just sort of said, okay, you know, not going to force, you know, I, I was never, ever coerced or forced, or I always had free will to choose. I mean, what was it like for you to have the final test be to marry Lama Dawa? I mean, what was that like for you in that oh, moment? That it decision? was hard. Yeah. It was, it was a tough 
tough one for me. I mean, it was tough for me anyway, because I was very, very happy being a nun. I, I very, it was a very clear decision I had made and I was very convinced that this was my path, you know, and I, you know, and Lama Dawa was married, you know, he had a wife. And, I, and so there's this part of me that's like, how am I going to work, you know, you know, like it's just on a conventional level, it, it, it's like, but I also, there was another part of me that understood that by doing so, it gave me the ability to be trained 24 seven with no um, d with no interruption, nobody could come in between me and my teachers. And that's what it was about. I understood that it was really about that. It was to set up a situation that I could receive the kind of training I did, which I would not have received ha had I not done that. Right. It, pr it created a situation that en enabled me to get this kind of training. And so there was a part of me that trusted his vision, even though I, for me, it, it created this, what about this? And what about, blah, 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 you know? And when I would share that with Lama Dawa, he would just say, oh, you have no confidence. You know, you have no confidence. And I'd be like, okay. My, I had this powerful connection to Lama Dawa, there's no doubt about it, but it wasn't romantic. I wasn't like, it wasn't a romantic attraction. But, um, but I understood that um, there was something more to this and uh, that powerful forces were at play. They really were. There was powerful forces at play that he could see that I couldn't really see. And I, there was just that part of me, that, that intuition that said, okay. It's it's going to be hard, and it was hard. It was it was hard on a lot of levels. <laughs> Took many years, you know. It created a lot of uproar. A lot of my old Dharma friends kind of like eh, she broke her vows, and like this. There was a lot of bad talk actually. Wow. And we had to deal with gossip and all this. People didn't understand, you know. They just see this kind of thing, and they don't really understand the inner workings that's really going on between us. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's okay. That's, yeah. that's has okay. that how has that impacted you just as a practitioner, kind of having people gossip and just the challenges of that? It's hard, yeah. Gossip gossip is one of the worst kinds of energy. It can create a lot of obstacles. And but Rinpoche dealt with it. You know, Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche really he did all kinds of pujas for me. He did I felt he he was a protective force. And because it was his precept and his, he took the responsibility for handling all the kind of negative energies. Yeah. That's right. You know, that's what it is. You're under their protection. Yeah. So you, as you're, if you're doing what your guru says, and, and this is my guiding principle to this day, that I have many samayas and many promises. And as long as I'm working in that, I'm very protected very protected by the lineage, very protected by the Dharma protectors, very protected by the blessings, as long as I'm, you know, doing according to my samayas. I don't have anything to worry about, you know, and I've seen that to be true. I'm, ta you know, taken care of, as we can say, and it is a protective mechanism. That's what the, uh, the blessings and the benefit of a lineage offers when you really take a lineage to heart and and people that flip from one thing to another one thing to another they don't really understand this benefit that a lineage gives you when you really dedicate yourself and you receive empowerments and you have this kind of training and you take some some of the samayas that we take are to create this protective mechanism that's what it is and when we break our samaya, we've broken that protective mechanism. And then, then we are subject to misfortune, actually. A lot of very difficult things can happen. So, yeah, so he took on a lot of the difficulties. There were difficulties in the first couple of years for everyone. And, you know, and I have to hand it to Lama Dao, to Kelsong, Lama Dao was why it was hard for her. She was so scared you know, that Lama Dawa was going to run off to America and, and abandon her like some other well-known Tibetan Lamas have done, whose names I won't mention. 
and run off with an American lady and leave their Tibetan families behind. You know, so we had to kind of work through that and, you know, but I have found that those kinds, like this is a polygamous marriage and I actually found it to be very beneficial. You know, it's actually, wow, you know, there's a lot of benefits to having extended families like this. What did you find to be beneficial about it? Well, you have a bigger support system. You know, I was very helpful to, for Kelsang to actualize the things that she wanted, like building this big house that she wanted. She was very supportive of my practices, helped me get the things I need for my practice. There's this mutual support there. You have a bigger support base. And then I, you know, adopted their daughter and brought her to the U.S. And she's now living in San Francisco, you know, so there's so much benefit to an extent we have these nuclear family structures in in the west you know monogamous nuclear family structures which that's what we believe but these polygamous and also they have polyandrous relationships i know many tibetan women who had several husbands Mm -hmm. so this extended family structure is is a different structure but there's a lot of benefits to it as long as everybody gets along, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm not a very jealous person. I don't, it's not one of my stronger poisons. Um, so I, it wasn't a problem for me that way. Um, and it was just very beneficial. And it sounds like there was good communication, like things were shared, like she shared her concerns. And- oh yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. And we had to work out all the kind of fears and you know, there had to be a really trust had to be established. And and now we're very close now. I mean, we're very close. But it took years to to get that trust, <laughs> you know, to build that kind of trust. Originally, what was Dorje Kunzung's motivation to have you as his consort to have you as Lama Dawa's consort? Why did he feel like that was so important for you to be with him? To do practices. Yeah, that, that there was and that's something that Lama Dawa also shared with me. There were prophecies, actually. He had some, uh, Ash, a Lama who was a very good astrologer, write prophecies that in his 49th year, he was going to meet his consort, who was going to come from the West, and her name would be Virtue. That was all interesting. My name was Gejong, which means Virtue. And so it was a kind of prophesized thing. And it was for the purpose of, I, I became Lama Dawa's activity consort. Right, so there's two kinds of consorts. There's the um, accomplishment consort, Drolium and Jorium, two kinds of consorts. And so I became Lama Dao's activity consort. Kelsung is his accomplishment consort. So one is for the purpose of your practice and one is for the purpose of your activity. So then Lama Dao's teaching career took off. Before I met Lama Dao, he really wasn't teaching much. You know, and so his activity that he, that he was destined to do happened through our relationship. I was the the support. A consort is a support, <laughs> literally. And so I was his activity consort, mm-hmm. right? Like Yeshe Sogyal is Guru Rinpoche's activity consort. Mandarava is his accomplishment consort. Right? So there are two kinds, two categories of consort. And so... And, but then, of course, it meant it was also for me to do these practices. You know, I had to be trained in these practices. When you become a consort, then you have all this training to do all these practices that you have to. It's part of your path. And then I, you know, have to take consorts after that. You know, I have had to take my own other consorts. It's part of the mechanism of these activities. First is you're cultivating your practice and then to enact your activities then, you know, then there's different functions of those practices. Mm